most everyone in Israel does two years of military service. And they have a neurodiverse population, those on the autism spectrum, just like anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And the Israelis were deploying many of those neurodiverse enlistees in the cybersecurity divisions that they have, Battalion 9900 and Battalion 8200. And why? Well, they needed a group of folks who were technically very savvy and proficient, who were detail-oriented, very focused, uh, driven by accuracy, uh, different ways of thinking, good pattern recognition to go through lines and lines and lines of computer code and look for gaps or potential vulnerabilities in that code for cybersecurity purposes. And they found that neurodiverse individuals almost had superpowers in doing that. Put that coffee down. Coffee's for closers only. Welcome to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm headquartered just outside Washington, D.C., we talk with some of America's most influential closers, from industry-leading CEOs to best-selling authors, professional athletes, entrepreneurs, and everyone in between. So grab a cup of coffee and sit back as we take you on an informative, thought-provoking, and highly entertaining journey into the lives of highly successful, driven, and forward-thinking disruptors who are making a lasting impact in their field and on society. Joining us on this week's episode of Coffee with Closers is Peter Kant. He is the chairman and chief executive officer of Enabled Intelligence, a technology company that provides secure and accurate data labeling and AI testing for sensitive and classified data sets for defense, intelligence, law enforcement, and other critical US government missions, including classified programs. A tireless advocate for diversity in the workplace, Peter discusses how he has created a team of veterans, neurodiverse professionals, and people with different abilities who are particularly adept at complex problem solving and attention to detail, skills which are required to carry out our nation's critical security work. He also shares his insights on how organizations can increase employment opportunities for persons with disabilities. Additionally, he sheds light on some of the greatest security challenges facing the U.S. today. Peter Kant, welcome to Coffee with Closers. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. A um, lot to get to today. I want to start with um, uh, your company, en Enabled Intelligence. Uh, you're the chairman and CEO. Uh, it's a Northern Virginia-based company which provides um, secure and accurate data labeling and AI technology testing for uh, sensitive and classified data sets across uh, government and the commercial sector. Um, just at a high level, can you talk a little bit about sort of what this work entails and what kind of clients you serve? Sure. Uh, data labeling is the foundation of all artificial intelligence technology and often completely overlooked. Yep. Um, what data labeling is, is for any machine, so an artificial intelligence system to do stuff, it has to be taught how to do stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and someone has to teach it. And the way artificial intelligence uh, software learns through a machine learning process is you give it a whole bunch, one gives it a whole bunch of data. Um, so for example, if you wanted to say, I want to find um, 747s parked at airports. So you want, and satellite imagery. What one would have to do is give, a, take a whole bunch of satellite imagery data with 747s in it and without 747s in it. Wow. And somebody has to put a box or indicate that's a 747, that's a 747. And you do that thousands and thousands and thousands of times, both with 747s and without, and with things that may confu confuse for 747s, like other airplanes or things that are similar shape or just weird shapes. Put all of that into a machine learning box, a computer, um, and that's where the black box part of it, of machine learning and AI happens is the computer draws correlations between what's a, some things that it says are 747 and things that the person didn't say. So labeling is the act of a person going through those original images and saying, that's a 747, that's a 747, that's not, that's not. And that takes a person to do. It's manual and it's labor intensive, but that's what data labeling is. Wow, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, I would, and and just talk about sort of what need are you meeting? I, obviously, your clients are across defense, homeland security, I assume law enforcement, uh, private sector. Um, do they need that for their, um, I mean, is that s something that's always outsourced or? 
Well, it's not, it's both not outsourced and can only be outsourced yeah. uh, to give an example. Yeah. So in the private sector, in the commercial sector, data labeling and AI enablement happens all the time. So take driverless vehicles. Um, people are making cameras and LIDAR systems um, to sense. So this car is driving around and it's taking video and it's like, oh, there's a child running across the street. There's a ball bouncing. There's a stop sign. Mm -hmm. There's a stop sign in the rain. There's a stop sign hidden behind a tree. Um, all of that had to be labeled by someone first to teach the, the driverless vehicle or the autonomous vehicle how to work. And most of that gets done overseas. Okay. So India, China, Malaysia, Kenya, lots of places overseas do that. Um, but that work is relatively straightforward and the data is not all that, it's not complicated and it doesn't require a lot of subject matter expertise. Yeah. You and I know what a stop sign is. We mm -hmm. can teach someone to say that's a eight-sided red sign which says it has letters on it and that's a stop sign. Um, and it can be sent overseas. And a lot of that is gig economy. So lots of folks who, you know, piecemeal hourly labor in India or Malaysia, um, putting bounding boxes around pictures of stop signs so that Tesla can create an autonomous vehicle. The U.S. government is also awash in data, like the Defense Department, the Army, uh, intelligence community, Department of Homeland Security, whether it be X-ray images at airports and you want to automate or help an AI find the guns and knives or water bottles in those carry-on bags, or it's satellite imagery for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency saying, I want to know if a new missile um, a launcher has been put near Pyongyang. Um, RF frequencies, audio data, all that kind of stuff. Well, you can't send that stuff overseas to get annotated for a couple of reasons. One, clearly security. You security. don't want to send our, you know, classified satellite imagery to China. They'd be happy to have it, I'm sure, but, um, and yeah. maybe expert in finding their own machines and their own military, but we don't want to do that. And two is the subject matter expertise. So it's one thing to say that's a stop sign or that's a ball bouncing across the street and have someone do that. It's another to say that's a Russian MiG-29 painted to look like a Ukrainian MiG-29 in a synthetic aperture radar image wow. at the, you know, in an obfuscated environment and camouflaged. You need a certain level of subject matter expertise and skill to be able to do that. Finally, um, error is a really big problem. Error would be catastrophic, right? Yeah. So uh, we do data labeling if we don't, but if somewhere do data labeling for Google Maps, what could happen is I get lost. We get do an error uh, for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and we may bomb the wrong place. Wow. So um, the government needs uh, secure, the data needs to stay secure. It needs to stay private. Um, uh, they need to know where it is, the data provenance. So it needs secure data labeling. It needs highly expert, you know, highly skilled data labeling. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be very accurate. Mm -hmm. A lot of that cannot be sourced overseas or in, in typical commercial. And that's the, the need we're meeting. Got it. Is your work, is it a 24-7 operation? Do you have like a command center? Can, <laughs> can you, can you, do you need to respond to crisis or someone needs something examined at, at a moment's notice or is it more is it just more uh, work that you would do in a daily course of a week uh, it's more work that we would do in a daily course of the week because yeah. we're um, the analysis that we're doing is to fuel AI artificial intelligence systems and software it. it's not like we're providing real-time analysis like uh oh uh, the North Koreans have moved uh, troop movements here what we're trying to do is help the government create AI software that uh, allow it to look at vast amounts of data to detect that as it's happening, but not have analysts. So it's really a way of trying to free up the analyst not to look for the routine, but to look for the new yeah. or the or the or the uh, the anomalies. We have had situations, um, we have had projects where we have been at two in the morning uh, in the office. Uh, the annotators have been working because intelligence collection and data collection and defense work is a 24 uh, seven yeah, type uh, mission. And there've been projects that have been global in scope where we're um, taking uh, data in real time from sensors globally or in space. And we're doing a sort of a, uh, a test operation or a demonstration um, or a training mission and doing it in real time. And we have had the opportunity to do that a couple of times, but typically it's, you know, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Yeah, <laughs> here. Just is there any elements of your work that um, are find relevance or similarities to like the chat GPT technology that, that can write your college paper? Or, well, or, or how does that, is there any connection at all? In well, the, certainly. I mean, chat GPT is a, is a natural language processing AI system. Yeah. Um, very 
complicated one and very large one, but it's it's basically an AI model. Yeah. And it's predicting what word should come next in the sentence based on verbal, you know, cues given. Wow. Uh, and we do audio and natural language processing annotation. So oh, wow. we will go look at strings of text and classify that's a person. Um, this is the intent. This is the emotional take because there's a difference um, from if I were to say today right now, if I were to, you asked me a question, I went, right? Or I said, right. Or I said, right. Or to the right. All those mean different things. They're the uh, same word. Okay. AI is not going to know that unless someone tells them. And so in like a chat GPT, which is looking for that intent and able to be able to write a paper or produce a recipe or whatever it may be, it needs to understand that. And the base of that, the foundation of all of that creation is data labeling. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And they can write papers in seconds. I guess so. Yeah. That's yeah. what I, that's, I so. should have known about them in college. It yeah. was too long ago for me. <laughs> so what, um, what was the genesis for the company? How did you, how did you get involved? Sure. So um, I've spent 25 years, my whole career, basically at the nexus of new technology, innovation, national security for the most part. Yeah. Although my background is in public policy and economics, but not a technologist. Yeah. But how does the government or how do government missions benefit from new technologies or even create more innovation? Got it. So when I was working with the Stanford Research Institute, SRI International, which is a large nonprofit R&D organization started in the 40s by Stanford University, primarily doing um, technology development for the government. Uh, for example, they were the first node on the ARPANET, which became the Internet, um, was between SRI, ARPA at the time here in Arlington, Virginia, and UCLA. Uh, they created Siri, which was originally a DARPA program uh, to help do voice activization for computers, for soldiers who couldn't use their hands because they were doing something else with their hands and wanted to use their voice. Uh, we created that natural language processing techno AI technology and then saw a commercial application and created Siri and sold it to Apple Computer. Okay. While I was there, we have a lot of AI programs primarily for the government. How do you look at satellite imagery or RF frequencies or signals intelligence, mostly audio, um, in multiple languages? And the government would come and have a question like, hey, we've got all of this... Um, sell traffic of potential bad guys in the Middle East. And we would love some way of listening to that and quickly hearing if someone is saying Osama is coming to Houston, but they're doing it in Pashtun, right? We don't know speak Pashtun. So it can create a natural language processing AI that would listen in and cue our analysts to when something odd is happening like wow. that. And we say, sure, give us the data. And the government says, well, it's classified data. I'm like, oh, we can handle classified, no problem. Send us the data. And they'd send us thousands of hours of audio, intelligence audio collection. And we'd say, well, none of this is labeled. We don't know what's a name versus a, a code word versus something like that. And then can you give it to us labeled government? And the government said, we don't label it. We don't have to label it. You label it. We're like, well, we're 2,200 PhDs. We're not going to label anything. And you certainly don't want us to pay, pay us to do that. Yeah. So you do a demonstration project, like you create a proof of concept, but you'd pick a language that there was lots of open source labeled data already, like English or Parisian French. Um, but that wasn't, and I would say this technology is doable. We can make it. We just need the data to be able to make that. Got it. And it just kept coming up. That problem just kept coming up and up and up. And so I'd left SRI. I, I went to go, I was the CEO of another startup doing computer vision AI and x-ray imagery, same problem. And so when that we sold that company, it's like, well, this is a need. The, the government has more, the U.S. government creates more data and has more access to more data than anywhere else in the world. And it's a wash in it that in doing that analysis in real time is exceedingly important and AI can help. And they're doing a lot of AI development, but they don't have that source foundational data, that that labeled data that's so necessary to make an unbiased and highly accurate AI system. So where could we, that need, that's a need that, that, that definitely needs to be met. And most of that work, as I alluded to earlier, is done overseas for commercial companies. Mm -hmm. So we needed an onshore um, domestic provision of more skilled, highly skilled uh, folks to do data labeling it. Where could that happen? And I had read, uh, doing research for another thing back in, in the late 2000, 2010s, of an Israeli program. Most everyone in Israel does two years of military service, and they have a neurodiverse population, those on the autism spectrum, just like anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And the Israelis were deploying many of those neurodiverse enlistees 
in the cybersecurity divisions that they have, Battalion 9900 and Battalion 8200. And why? Well, they needed a group of folks who were technically very savvy and proficient, who were detail-oriented, very focused, uh, driven by accuracy, uh, different ways of thinking, good pattern recognition, to go through lines and lines and lines of computer code and look for gaps or potential vulnerabilities in that code for cybersecurity purposes. And they found that neurodiverse individuals almost had superpowers at doing that. Wow. The ability to stay focused, detail-oriented, pattern recognition, and that sort of different social dynamic that, that um, neurodiverse individuals have is perfect for, for a type of job where you're kind of solitary, you're just staring at a screen a lot of the time and, and doing that. So I thought, well, data labeling is very similar. It's, you need technical proficiency, um, detail orientation, extreme focus, pattern recognition, and not thrown by context clues, like really looking at what's the right answer. And so a that different, more diverse way of thinking could be quite useful. And here in the US, uh, it's certainly an underemployed population. So when we needed a domestic population, U.S. citizens who could get cleared, who um, could do this type of work, I felt that was an untapped population. That's what I smushed together. The need for data labeling from the government that's secure and, and accurate with subject matter expertise in this underemployed but highly capable population of neurodiverse individuals. And we mushed that concept together, and that's how we created enabled intelligence. Wow, that's in it's incredible. I understand that um, more than half of your uh, company's workforce is uh, – Comprised of neurodiverse employees, yep. is that? Is that yep, that's that, correct. Yeah. A little wow. over half. Wow, that's amazing. Um, all right, that sounds good. So I want to, uh, uh, continuing on this theme, um, I also understand your hiring process to bring these individuals into the workforce and into your company um, is very unique in a way that accommodates their needs. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you find the, these employees encourage them, attract them to come to your company, and what um, what are what are some of the ways that um, they go through the the hiring process um, that that might be a little bit different than maybe some other traditional employee, uh, you know? That sure, that been, no, yeah. great question. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's some scary parts, of course, of creating a startup. Like you don't know if it's going to work, and you don't know where money's going to come from. But yeah. there's some great parts, which is you get to build everything from scratch if you yeah. want to. And we really did build our. Rec um, recruiting, on uh, interviewing, and onboarding and support uh, mechanisms for our employees mm -hmm. from scratch, knowing that we were going to have this very diverse um, uh, employee cadre and, and group and team. So um, one is the traditional ways of looking for employees or writing position descriptions we got rid of. There are no um, minimum education uh, requirements. Um, there are no... Uh, you know, we don't look at what school they went to or this or GPAs or, you know, did they have a degree in computer science or the like to be able to, to join our company? Um, because a lot of folks, especially neurodiverse folks, did not have the traditional schooling system did not work for them. So they may have come out and gotten a GED or a high school degree or maybe some of our folks do have college degrees. Um, and that's also the case for uh, many of our military veterans. Some of them went into the military right out of high school um, and didn't go to college but have incredible skill sets and experience and expertise that aren't captured by what school did you go to or did you get a BA? Yeah. Um, so we took all that out. And also we know that the interview process for folks who have different ways of communicating uh, and interacting with people can be quite stressful or different. And you may not get their actual capabilities out of a in-person interview. So the first thing we did is we created, we just want to know, can they do the work? Mm -hmm. And we, um, our engineering team and, and the data science team, we created um, just an online sort of, not really a test, I would call an assessment or a trial. And anyone who applies to, for a position at Enabled Intelligence, especially an annotation position, first thing we do, we send them a link. Um, to the, It's just automated, sends them a link and they go online and they get a small annotation project to do. And we provide the directions, very clear directions for how to do this project. Verbally, um, so there's an audio track, there's a video track, and there's just a written track, oh, right? Wow. So whatever, however best they learn, however best they take in information, or if they want to do all three, it doesn't matter to us. They take it all on, and then they do this project. There's probably like 50 images, 20 to 50 images, depending on the level of annotator we're, we're looking at, and we're asking them to annotate the objects in the, in the 
but it could be to put boxes around all the airplanes or this. And we get very specific. Don't include shadows. Be sure to include the whole airplane, but make it very tight. Uh, don't include broken ones, so whatever it may be in the direction. And then there's a score that comes out of that. How many, did, you know, what's their error rate? How long did it take them to do it? And as long as they meet that minimum standard that we have, we consider that someone who can work at Enable Intelligence. And our job from that point on is to see how do we employ them, not how do we test them for employment. Got right? it. They can do the work. Now it's up on us on what is it? Can they do the work here? Can they do it? Interesting. And so all the parts of the interview from that point on are like, okay, what do you do? How do you work best? Do you like quiet? Do you need to be able to get up and move around? Do you do your work best earlier in the morning or late at night? And we build all that flexibility for each individual employee when they come in. So we have some employees who truly start at 4.30 in the morning in the office annotating because that's when they work. They're done by 2 or 3 or whatever, and they're gone. Some um, come around 9, 10, maybe 11 o'clock um, and stay late because they work better in that environment. Some do a morning session, take a decent break in the day, and then come back for an evening session. Mm -hmm. We have some who are... Um, uh, hypersensitive. They need quiet. Um, so we have areas in the office that are more similar to what I saw here. There's more quiet rooms. People can have headphones. They can sit and work. We have others that are more uh, hyposensitive. They need to be moving around. They need a fidget spinner. They need uh, music. They, and so we you know, have places in the office where they can work. Um, how we do uh, team meetings, Right? Not everything is in person. Uh, some, most of our work has to be done in the office because the data stays secure and it stays in our office. Um, so meetings can be in the office. People can call into those meetings. Uh, people can Zoom or, or, or video conference into those meetings. Wow. Um, all of it is designed. So how is that employee best enabled to what you need them to do is go through lots of data and be exceedingly accurate and thorough and efficient on how they label it. Whatever that takes, that's what we, that's how we design our offices yeah. and our work with them. You're listening to Coffee with Closers, a podcast produced by Pinkston, a strategic communications firm based just outside Washington, D.C. Whether your organization is looking for traditional public relations, creative content, or business strategy to support brand awareness or protect against reputational risks, our team of highly dedicated, experienced, and successful communications professionals stand at the ready to help you break through the noise in today's ever-changing and competitive news cycle. For more on our services and capabilities, we invite you to visit us at pinkston.co. And don't forget, subscribe to our podcast, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. There are a lot of companies that are in your space, and I assume it's a very, from what I understand, a very competitive environment. Does the neurodiverse workforce, the employees that you have, the military veteran teams, does that make does that make enabled intelligence a bit of a differentiator in in this space? Is there is there something that it's it's a huge differentiator for us, um, and. It's not because they're, they're differentiator because they're on staff. It's because of what their result is. Yeah. So um, all AI, it's the old saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? So if you feed an AI bad data, it's going to give you a bad answer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you feed it better data, it's going to give you a better answer. If you feed it really good data, it's going to have the best chance of giving you a good result and good answer. So we focus a lot on accuracy on annotation accuracy and data accuracy. Mm -hmm. Having veterans in our neurodiverse population means that our accuracy rates are orders of magnitude better than our competitors. The way we keep, we win business and the way we keep business is our data sets are pristine, yeah. if you will. And the government has been exceeding, our government customers have been exceedingly happy with that data quality. And that comes from our workforce. Yeah. Um, there's no special tool. There's no software we use. There's nothing like, I mean, there are software tools and things that we use, but there's, that's not what makes it um, accurate. And that's not what makes our data good and makes the resulting AI great. It's those people. Um, and that is a huge discriminator. Yeah, that's great. Um, and in speaking about neurodiverse employees, um, you mentioned the Israeli example that sort of helped take your idea to, to the startup and company that it is. Um, 
here in the United States, I was reading some statistics here. Um, according to the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, uh, the intelligence community is falling short of the 12% federal target for workforce representation of persons with disabilities. And um, the percentage actually has uh, has decreased um, from about 10, you know, decreased to 10.9 from 11.9%. Um, so what can we do as a country to change this trajectory? Obviously, you guys are doing great work, and um, there are a lot of companies in the private sector, other companies, major companies that are doing this as well. It's being seen more today as <clears throat> a way to, um, you know, empl employ people and deal with the shortage issues that we've had coming out of COVID. Given that other countries have established these types of programs that you've employed, what what do, what do we do to change this trajectory? Well, there have been some positive pockets within the government. Yeah. Um, mm. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, has a pilot program um, for uh, hiring neurodiverse professionals into their analytics uh, and analysis areas of, of, the, of that agency. Um, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency has a group that focuses on neurodiversity, employment and support, yeah. as well as others. Um, and the progress is nice and progress is good. Um, what I would say, though, is we tend, we, and I mean we as the community, if you will, but the government in this case, we keep looking at these as demo projects. Yeah. Let's start a demo project and try this out. Let's do a, a quick piece, uh, little project here and see how, a, 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 or a task force. That's never going to work. Yeah. Um, because it limits, it's like, oh, we have a task force, we hired our 10 people, or we hired our 20 people, or whatever it may be. Um, this has to be part, a recognition that neurodiverse individuals can be part of any team. They don't need to be part of a special team yeah. um, or in a, a unique, people like, oh, well, data labeling is perfect or cyber is perfect because of those things that you just said, Pete, about neurodiverse folks being accurate and detail oriented and focused. There are very few jobs out there where, you know, detail orientation and focus are bad things. Yeah. Um, so I think the, there's still a little too much effort or, or focus in many of the government programs on creating like a pilot or a demonstration. And you sort of limit by design then where you can employ folks. Oh, you're a nerd or is perfect. I have this 10 person pilot that can, as soon as a slot opens up there, you're the next one in. Meanwhile, I have 8,000 other employees or 40,000 other employees in this federal agency. What, what gives over there, yeah. right? And that, that's where I think we can see a lot more um, activity. Uh, it, they're starting. I mean, these demo projects are certainly helpful in breaking down barriers, people realizing, oh, they're not weird. They're not, th this isn't going to be hard. They can get security clearances. They care about the mission. They understand what we're saying. I mean, all these sort of initial barriers that often get thrown up, at least those program, those pilot programs are showing those are moot or those don't exist. Yeah. But now it's time to take it from that level and say, okay, this is something that can happen throughout our organization, not yeah. just in a pilot program. Yeah. So what I hear you saying is, what is it, the famous Nike saying, just do it. Just do it. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, a couple of other questions I had. Um, what have you, is anything since you started this adventure three years ago, has anything surprised you? Anything that you maybe were a little bit hesitant about or a little apprehensive of, and you look back and say, wow, now this, this is all working really well or, or just, you know, anything about running a, running a business is hard. No, um, as anyone who's, who does yeah. a startup shows you, there's never any bumps along the road and there's yeah. never any surprises. Yeah. <laughs> of course there are. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's been a few, um, mostly positive surprises. So one of the things that we looked at is we built when we, uh, so one of my first hires, I guess my actual first hire was our chief people officer, Lauren, Lauren Bacon Smith, because I knew it was a people based business and we really had a really strong HR and sort of people focused part of our culture. And so that was the first hire we made. And when she and I were, were first bringing our, you know, looking at bringing people on and what this looked like, we felt that this ended, this business would have a lot of turnover. Yeah. Right. So, um, don't know if you've ever sit and look at a screen all day, every day and putting boxes around pictures. But most of us we think that that would get old pretty quick and mind numbing. Um, and so we thought we'd have a lot of turnover. Now we've designed things where people are working on multiple projects on the same day. So they're sure. not looking at the same thing or doing the same analysis. They keep it sort of fresh. Um, but we were worried about that kind of turnover. And we didn't really know about this. Um, neither of us had any experience in working with neurodiverse populations. So we didn't know what it would be like to support them. Would they stay in the office? Would it be 
kind of tough. And then of course there was the added complexity of we started this during COVID and we needed to be in the office and how is that going to work? Yeah. And we have not had any turnover. Sorry. We have, we have lost one employee who um, I'll go ahead and let happen because uh, she went to grad school. So yeah. <laughs> that seems like a good thing. Um, but otherwise uh, it's gone exceptionally well. And what we've learned through this process is there are a few things I think that have driven that retention. Yeah. Um, number one is the team is very committed to the mission. They do feel mm -hmm. like they're contributing and they are contributing to a lot of missions. We had a project where we were looking at um, bomb damage in Ukrainian agricultural fields so that Ukrainian farmers could, where could we see that? So we could say where it was safe for Ukrainians to go back and harvest and and where they should stay away from to stay safe. The team felt very motivated by that project because they really is, they realized they were helping Ukrainians sort of go back to a little bit where they could get back and, and generate um, agricultural goods and food and feed people and also some revenue and get back to some normalcy in those places. Um, so there's a lot of that motivation throughout the team, neurodiverse veterans and everyone alike. Yeah. Another is this drive, inherent drive that many of our team have of getting an answer, a right answer, doing it right, finding everything, puzzle solving yeah. is a huge motivator. Um, and so what you and I may find is mind numbing, it's because we're not really exploring the full problem and they are. Right. Um, and then a nice little surprise that none of us have expected is a lot of our team members have been underutilized in their prior employment. Like we have one guy, he has a degree in uh, computer science from a university here, it's neurodiverse, was unemployed, worked in an Amazon um, fulfillment house and was a barista. None of that using their computer skills. Now they're using their computer skills and they just feel much more engaged in the work they're doing. Wow. But they also feel very engaged with each other. The part that I was very surprised by oh, wow. is they didn't really have a community. This has become their community. This is their friend group. This is who they hang out with. They have Slack channels and talk amongst each other. They have they share dinner recommendations and restaurant nights. And um, so coming into the office and being together was a huge draw for them. In addition to doing work that they understand, not just understand, but are devoted to the mission and are using their skill sets. And all that's come together to create a really sticky and lasting workforce and one that we were not expecting. Got it. Back in September, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin made an announcement related to your company. Um, what was it? Uh, so we were able to, we had grown very quickly and we needed new space. And so we were going to move into some permanent headquarters and office space. And we're looking here, uh, of course, in our home state of Virginia and uh, got space here in just on the street from where we are today in, in Falls Church. And um, with that, we had some help from Fairfax County identifying some places. There's some um, uh, jobs programs out there that, uh, encourage folks to hire or companies to hire persons with disabilities. We are also a, a Virginia Values Veterans employer, employer certified by the state. That's great. And so we were announced what the governor announced, uh, along with uh, folks from the our state house uh, delegations, and here in Fairfax County and Falls Church, was our expansion. Was that and 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 we are slated to get up to about 117, if not over that, employees here in the next couple of years. Wow. Um, and added 10,000 square feet of office space, um, inclusive of highly secure facilities to let us do classified work for the government at the highest levels, um, and made over uh, a little over a million and a half a dollar investment into creating that. And so that's what the, the governor was announcing. Wow. A couple last questions. I want to zoom out just a little bit. Um, you have worked for most of your professional career at the intersection of uh, technology and government. Um, from your vantage point, um, and obviously you work in national security and other things, um, is there anything as a CEO that keeps you up at night, either with respect to challenges our country faces, um, our workforce. Um, is there anything in particular that, that you think about that, that maybe just keeps you up and that we should be as a country, you know? Well, there's plenty of things that keep me up and yeah. just as a, a, a citizen, it, it, yeah, as a citizen um, but, less than as a CEO. But, but you have uh, a lot of, you have a lot of experience. So I wanted to get your sense. Yeah. Of so what I would, 
this experience itself, I think, has heightened for me something that I I believe fundamentally is the strength of the country and something that I would not like to see us lose mm -hmm. um, as we sort of navigate these last few years and going forward of, of differing opinions and and um, ideas percolating across our country, which is the strength of the United States since its inception has it's been its willingness to embrace diversity, not always perfectly and certainly not all along at the beginning. Right. Um, and even as we go along, there's still huge gaps. But each time that we've erred on the side of, you know, adding women, uh, giving women the ability to vote, you know, the, the right to vote, um, uh, uh, the civil rights movement, um, 18 year old and getting, right? but when we've you know gotten rid of the horrid institution of slavery and, and the like, every time we've expanded what it means to be an American and added more diversity to that, our country has gotten stronger. Mm -hmm. And specifically at the nexus of technology and government or technology, I think we're founded on a belief that one way that we can defeat the Chinese, if you will, or compete with the Chinese, we're not in open warfare with the Chinese, so we don't have to defeat them today, um, is leveraging our diversity. So, and this is especially the case with artificial intelligence. The Chinese have more data, more people, and while not the larger economy yet, could be at that point, so mm -hmm. conceivably more money. But that top down driven monolithic approach, command and control approach that a dictatorship creates um, does not give diversity of thought, which means that it gives a, they can make a huge play and make a huge investment and one way to go. But if that's the wrong way to go, changing the ship is quite difficult and they'll be thrown. So yes, there was this um, very public and worrying report a couple of years ago about a facial recognition in China and they flew a drone into a Chinese uh, soccer stadium and they could identify all these people in there just by their face, which was a huge step forward in, in facial recognition, except for 90% of the people in that stadium were Han Chinese. Mm -hmm. Could they do it in, an, in a stadium in Nigeria? Could they do it in a stadium in Columbus, Ohio, where folks are different, lots of different uh, um, perspectives, looks, feels and the like? No. Um, and I, that's a very basic example, but our ability to leverage diverse thinking and encourage diverse thinking, individuality, which is a hallmark of our country, um, is what's made, what can make our technology better, but it's made our economy extremely strong, um, our competitive nature, our ability to innovate at a macroeconomic level. But then at this micro level, at the AI standpoint, our, our technology will be better if we start limiting what it means to be American, um, or we don't embrace diversity, we will be, we will lose. We will be worse off. Wow. Um, uh, wow. And I think that's something to remember. Yeah. Good points. Um, we're going to give you the last word, Peter. Is there anything that uh, I didn't ask you today that you feel uh, you wanted to share with our viewers and listeners? Uh, no, this was a great conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's always fun to talk about what we've been doing. Oh, that's great. Well, Peter, Peter Kahn, thank you uh, for joining us on Coffee with Closers. Uh, to our listeners uh, out there, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and also rate us on iTunes as well. Thank you, Peter, for joining us today and continue the great work that you're doing to uh, keep our country secure and, and uh, obviously strengthen the, the diversity of what makes us so great. Thank you. Thanks. A, B, C. A, always B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. We're the Pinkston team, and this has been Coffee with Closers. Be sure to subscribe for more episodes and follow us on Twitter, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Catch us next time. We know you're not busy.